Hello, can you hear me okay? Too loud, too loud, or good? Loud enough, okay, good. Not loud enough? Louder than that? How's that? Okay. All right, hello everybody. Welcome, welcome to the first in-person Austin DSA meeting since February, 2020. Glad to be here. My name, my name is Jake Jackson. Uh, I serve on the leadership committee of Austin DSA as uh, the communications coordinator. And I am here uh, subbing in as acting chair for Leah, who is sick right now and is uh, in, out in Zoom uh, land. Get better, Leah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so yeah, I'm very happy to stand here before you at this, uh, you know, historic Austin DSA meeting, uh, you know, since uh, the first one since the pandemic. Pretty good, uh, if you ask me. Uh, you know, losing the ability to convene in person was, was a big loss for, uh, you know, just organizing in general, but especially uh, coming right out of the Bernie campaign and the Heidi Sloan congressional campaign, where we were out pretty much every day talking to people about our politics, uh, getting getting people active in the movement, uh, you know, kind of having that abrupt break right after the primary where we weren't even able to get together was was, was a significant loss for us. I think that being said, uh, you know, we've made do with the circumstances that we were given and uh, I've done a really good job. I think, you know, we've grown significantly uh, since since that last in-person meeting. Hundreds of people have joined Austin DSA. Uh, we've put on we've put on some good political campaigns. Uh, our political education programs better than ever. Uh, we've got more people uh, doing labor organizing. Uh, we've had a lot of success uh, with stuff like the restaurant organizing project and Ewok. Uh, so it's uh, you know it's we we played with the cards we were dealt, and I think we've done a good job. You know I'm.
Yeah, that's right. Go I got to. <laughs> then I, the list goes on. You know, I could I could stand here all night and uh, rattle off uh, different parts of the country. There's bus drivers, there's nurses, there's coal miners in Alabama, telecom workers in California. We've got uh, the people who make Kellogg cereal. They're all on strike right now. We've got symphony musicians in San Antonio. There's steel workers in Pennsylvania on strike. On and on. And so this is really a show of force by workers that we haven't seen in a long time. It's still uh, small compared to, you know, sort of the heroic age of, of, of labor and social organizing in the 30s and 40s, and then the long strike wave of the 70s. But this moment does have, it has a serious promise and it's something that we have to take advantage of. It's really incumbent upon all of us to capitalize on this moment in which we're living and to help ensure that this moment becomes a movement uh, that lasts beyond uh, sort of uh, this, this particular moment that we're in. That's right. <laughs> yes. So our, I think our fundamental task today is to harness the sense of injustice that millions of people across the country are feeling right now and to direct it into lasting organization and into collective action. Uh, a little reverb there, it's okay. Uh, you know, it's no secret that the odds are stacked against people like you and me, uh, working people who, uh, you know, right, rightly see that, you know, something's wrong in our lives, in our workplaces, uh, in our, you know, family, and, and just all of these myriad of issues, which I could list. Uh, the odds are stacked against us. Uh, you know, all the powers of the capitalist class and their representatives at all levels of government are arrayed against our movement. But, you know, that being said, I think that what striking workers all over the country have shown is that when you stand shoulder to shoulder, united as a class, you can win. And I think that's a very powerful thing. So it goes without saying that building a mass movement for democratic socialism is uh, not easy by any means. I think, uh, uh, you know, there are no easy victories and, uh, you know, people, people like us who, uh, you know, are fighting the good fight are, uh, you know, we're in for a lot of hard, hard defeats, but we have to, you know, take it on the chin uh, and just kind of keep this long-term vision in mind. And, uh, you know, all we can do in our capacity as individuals in this organization is continue talking to people about issues and uh, you know, raising general consciousness, getting more and more people involved, talking to our coworkers, our family members, our friends, our neighbors about uh, you know, the pressing political issues of our day and getting people not only uh, conscious, but also uh, getting them into action, which is something that DSA has, has been very effective at. You know, it, we're in a moment where uh, this, we have the largest socialist organization uh, in a century, uh, since, since DSA has uh, almost 100,000 members nationally, uh, well over 1,500 locally, which is uh, no small feat. And, and, uh, and, you know, I think, I think we're ready more than ever to uh, really, to really take advantage of our moment uh, like we did with the Bernie campaign uh, and, uh, you know, continue to build this organization. And uh, we're going to hear tonight about a lot of ways that you can get involved in our movement and, uh, and yeah, ways that you can carry this vision, uh, positive vision of, of, the, of a future society free from exploitation and oppression in all its forms forward. So solidarity forever. Thank you. Uh, ne next up, thank you. Next up uh, on the agenda, uh, we're going to be talking about a uh, local issue that I know a lot of people uh, 
have been involved with and are knowledgeable of uh, this uh, ballot proposition called Prop A, which is very bad. No one. <laughs> uh, and so to talk about that, we have a good lineup of speakers. I believe uh, I believe Chris Harris, our good friend Chris Chris Harris, is first up. If he's oh he's right there, perfect. Welcome, Chris Harris. Oh, thank y'all so much. I just left my bike lights right there. Don't let me forget them, all right? Uh, <laughs> uh, appreciate y'all so much. I don't normally read, but I have, I have some things to say, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna work this and hopefully it'll, it'll still come off all right. Uh, how are y'all doing tonight? How's all right, but really, how are y'all doing tonight? All right, all right, good. So that's, that's the raw, raw portion, all right? <laughs> thank y'all. Um, so policing, we're gonna talk about Prop A. Policing in America was founded to control people in space to protect the property of the rich and the powerful, okay? That's why the first authorized law enforcement agencies in the state of Texas were slave patrols. Forces designed to ensure the property of slave owners, enslaved people were captured, punished, and returned to their owners. That's why immediately following emancipation, laws designed to control newly freed black people were passed throughout the South. These black codes were designed to ensure that slave catchers now turned into police departments could keep newly freed black people off city streets and return them to the plantations via the only form of legal slavery left. The 13th Amendment says in prison, okay? It's why those similar anti-loitering laws were passed in the North as well. So industrialists could deploy police as their plantation owning brethren did right in the South to keep workers in line and prevent them from organizing. All right? Policing in America remains first and foremost about controlling people and space to protect the property of the rich and powerful. So why laws protecting roadways were used last week against workers striking against John Deere, justifying an injunction that prohibits more than four workers from assembling at one factory right now. Boo, that's right, that's right. It's why laws enabled curfews Kettling and outrageous brutality by police against Black Lives Matter protesters uh, that dared question the racist status quo of resource distribution in this country. And it's why those same anti-vagrancy black codes were re-implemented right here in Austin, Texas, this May, to keep the poorest people away from expensive downtown real estate and out of sight of the wealthiest homeowners in this city. Uh -huh. And that was done, in, thanks in no small part, to the leadership of the police association right here in town. That's right. And now that police association is back with their Republican friends, with Prop A, okay? So what are they trying to do? They're trying to force this city to hire hundreds and hundreds of more police at a cost of over half a billion dollars. They want to take the share of the police budget already an outrageous 40% and push it up to 50% of our entire city budget. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Not only uh, would this uh, prolong increase race and class-based mass incarceration, we're talking about forcing cuts to our essential social services, destroying the very fabric of our city and the meager efforts we're making today to try to address income inequality. <laughs> That's right. Those that say we need police to fight crime are either a cop, uh, an elite looking to trick us into getting more folks to expand the force that protects their interests, or they have no idea what police actually do on a daily, okay? Scholar and abolitionist Ruth Wilson Gilmore says that, quote, capitalism requires inequality and racism enshrines it. By not only enforcing, but aggressively pursuing laws that enable themselves to control workers and non-white people, and by pushing for greater and greater budgets that diminish efforts to reduce inequality, often using race-based fear mongering, policing is central to the inequality and racism at the heart of our exploitative status quo. When migrants band together to brave treacherous waters and brutal deserts to escape horrors wrought by imperialism and climate change, who gets deployed to whip, detain, and deport them? Police, that's right when LGBTQIA plus folks come together to create safe spaces for themselves, to simply be themselves in public, who gets deployed to exclude 
uh, humiliate and brutalize them. Police. When black people organize and march for equal social, economic, and political rights, who gets deployed to hose us, put sick dogs on us, and beat us down? Police. That's right. And when workers show solidarity and protest our exploitation, who gets deployed to break up strikes and force us back to work? Police. That's right. So now we need to come together. <laughs> we need to show solidarity right now. Uh, we have to fight Prop A with all our might. We're looking at 6%. I haven't seen today's returns. Voter turnout in this city right now. Where is what? <laughs> all right. And you, you'd be surprised. The turnout's in the same rich West Dawson neighborhoods that passed Prop B. Are we going to let them win another election? We got to step up and show some power, folks. Now is the time. We have to come together. My man Seneca here is going to tell us how we can. Uh, all the ways we can get get engaged. Seneca Sawai, everybody. All right, so I'm going to spend a few minutes laying out the plan. But before I go on, I want to point out that a uh, little over to my left, uh, metaphorically and spatially, uh, is Clarissa, uh, who wrote the plan, right? The how we're going to win. Uh, and Clarissa was supposed to come up and talk. Uh, but then when I showed the crowd, how many of you there were, she, uh, they, sorry, uh, were like, the fuck I am. <laughs> so, hey, so this lady stakes here. Right now, about 6% of folks have voted. We had a spike today, about 7,000 people did. So that's 40,000. That is roughly one out of three of the people that are likely to vote in this election. So that means nothing is won or lost yet. Now, I don't want to lie. They've spent millions of dollars contacting tens of thousands of people, but they've bitten off more than they can chew. It turns out a lot of people in Austin don't like homeless folks, but they also don't like cops. And we found out of the doors, when we go knocking through the universe that we've been building, because we didn't stop knocking doors after Prop B, right? We kept on going to talk to people about defunding the police the entire summer, and we found 25,000 people who agreed with us, which is a whole lot. And we went back to those folks and said, this would give all that money to police. And it turns out they don't like that. So what we have to do this week is talk to thousands more. We know who a lot of the people who say they're going to vote against Prop A are. We know their names. We know their addresses. We have talked to them before, and we need to get them to go to the polls. We know where they are, and we've drawn up the list. So we'll go over in a second, but there are tables over here where we have taken all the highest disparity uh, precincts. That is where we have identified people who are going to vote against Prop A, who haven't voted yet, and we're going to go talk to them. On clipboards will be a walk list. So we're not going to have to put up a bunch of canvases. People who feel confident can walk up over to one of those tables, and you will get a list with 30 to 40 doors of people who have already said they're going to vote against this, and you're going to ask them to actually go and vote. If we do that, if we get through our highest probability precincts, that last weekend, this one coming up, Halloween weekend, we go all out because we will have gotten our prime targets out in voting, which means we get to turn our attention to the rest of the city. And Save Austin Now is doing the same thing. They spent $40,000 in Facebook ads alone in the last week. But they don't have a 10 to 1 advantage like they did last time. They don't have every single union in the city on their side, and they do. A lot of you have been involved in this campaign. We have knocked thousands of doors. We've built a whole second campaign to fill in gaps that the primary one left, right? And we've done a really good job of it. But if you're thinking, I'll do something Monday, I'll do some, I'll do some poll watching election. The thought that comes up to my mind, a lot of you may have been there last March when we were in the Hall of Schultz Garden um, and there was just a, a speech from Killer Mike that made me cry over and over again. And that thought is echoing through my mind. Does everybody remember what, what the, the catchphrase was from that one? I'll give you a clue. The time is now. The time is now. The time is not next Tuesday. The time to act is not mm, if the weather's all right this weekend. 
there has been a concerted, funded, strategic attack on work that this chapter did to de decriminalize homelessness, to defund the police in Austin by the largest amount of any city in the country, to put in place the most progressive prosecutor in the country, right? One of our members is the DA right now. And when you make moves, you threaten people in power and it turns out they don't like it, right? So they spent millions of dollars on doing things that we had done and they're doing it again. And this time they've bitten off more than they can chew. So I'm gonna ask each and every one of you, if you have it in you, if you feel like you can have a conversation with somebody who already said they're gonna vote against this, as this meeting's going on, you're gonna go over to the tables over here um, that are gonna be divided up by area of town and pick up a clipboard. Those clipboards are gonna have a number on them that'll give you the list of where you can go and knock on people who haven't voted yet, that we know are gonna vote our way. If we get a third of the people at this meeting to knock on those doors, done. We get it done before the weekend. And then this weekend we go hard. Because they don't get, they get one, they don't get any more. And then we're gonna use the power we built, which look to your left and right. What you see is not just some people who came out to get some food, not some people who are starved for social attention. When you look to your left and your right, you see power. And if you want to use the power against the people who are putting every set they can in the grinding our movement into dust, the time is now. the time is now. the time is now. thank you. I don't know how to follow that. I'm gonna be honest. Um, I also feel like I came up here really early, a little too early. Um, <laughs> uh, so the Seneca said there are three parts of town. Um, I wanted to just tell you a little bit about them. It's gonna be Southwest, um, North Shoal Creek, and um, Manchac Manchaca and Stasny. These are the lowest turning out ID areas. And it's so, so important that we talk to them. We've already gotten, what is it, like 13,000 IDs. And we wanna go talk to these people, pull them out of their house in, into a voting location. Um, the last thing that I was asked to bring up was that one of our canvassers for Homes Not Handcuffs works at a senior center, senior center and they need help transporting folks to the polls. So if anyone here on Friday at 11 a.m., like two or three people want to help get folks to the polls who want to vote but can't, um, you can talk to my friend Jacob Aronowitz right over there and he'll hook you up. And that's all I have. Y'all are beautiful and perfect. This is my first USA meeting and I love all of you. Thank you. One last thing, we'll be putting up links in the agenda for this because we're after we go and we do this on our own, we're gonna get together and knock some more doors on the weekend. And then Monday, 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 we're gonna do our last phone bank. Everybody who hasn't voted, they're gonna get blown up by us because we're gonna have a dialer and we're gonna get as many of you as possible on a call. If we get 25 of the people here on one of those dialers, we can make a pass to 25,000 people. There's not that many people on the list. That means we get to call each of those people twice. Uh, so they should vote if they don't wanna hear from us a whole bunch of times. I lied, I have one more, one more thing. Sunday at 2 p.m., we have a Halloween canvas. You should come dressed up in a costume and talk to people and again, get them to vote. It'll be over here at Mueller Lake Park, 2 p.m. I hope to see all of you lovely people there. Bye. All righty, thank you. I think that uh, that's, that's it for that, that section, right? Okay, good. Uh, next up. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Hey, hey, y'all, uh, if you walked off with the Southern Sign Up clipboard for canvassing, just bring it back to the table when you get a chance. Okay, thank you. Don't, don't steal our clipboards, guys. Uh, okay, uh, so next up, uh, we have uh, Andrew Hairston here to speak about housing and uh, tenant stuff. Cool. <laughs> Good evening, comrades. 
It is so good to see each and every one of you. My name is Andrew Hairston. I'm a civil rights lawyer and a writer. And really, as of today, a candidate for Justice of the Peace, Precinct 1 in Travis County. Let's get it. Let's get it. We're in there. So my story is an American story. I'm a Black Southerner. I am deeply embedded in the United States and the history of this country through my lineage, right? Uh, I have really developed a zeal and a passion for social and racial justice over the past three years. And this is the moment where I have been a civil rights lawyer for five years, where I've been fighting for the rights of young people, fighting to dismantle the school prison pipeline, fighting to get police out of schools, but fighting for community health and care. And this is where we are. After everything that we've endured for the past 18 months alone, the coronavirus pandemic taking 750,000 people almost in the United States alone, the sustained social movement since George Floyd, Brian Taylor, Mike Ramos, Tony McDade, all of these black and brown people who were taken by state violence from us prematurely, right? We recognize there's people over profit, y'all. We had that introductory speech to talk about the resurgence of American labor in this moment. And here we are at every point, recognizing how community care is gonna be what gets us through the future. You know, it's not the police, it's not prisons. We'll very frankly say I'm an abolitionist, right? Woo! <laughs> <Fuck> 12. <laughs> Going for it. But what drew me to being a candidate for Justice of the Peace, Precinct 1, is all of those experiences. Being a Black Southerner, being a civil rights lawyer, recognizing that we cannot do business as usual, right, for the sake of humanity, and to understand that my challenger or the incumbent, Judge Yvonne Williams, has made history in her own right as a Black woman that came up through the late 20th century. But representation politics is simply not enough. That is not sufficient for what we need to sustain humanity in this next phase of the 21st century. So yeah, I'm humbly here before y'all ask your support to know that I will fight to keep kids in their classrooms. Any truancy referrals that come to my court, I'll be sending kids right back to their classrooms. I'm gonna keep tenants in their homes and I'm gonna strive assiduously to keep people housed so that they can have those intergenerational inter sites of joy that is a home that they can pass down to their children and say that great grandma was here and sustained our family so that we could enjoy this home. And so we're live at hairstonforpeace.com. All the socials about to come up. <laughs> and I just thank y'all so much for the opportunity to speak to y'all tonight. Solidarity forever. <clears throat> All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew. Uh, let me see. Where is uh, where's old Paul? Wait, wait, next up, we've got uh, we've got Paul Steiner. <laughs> uh, here he comes. Uh, we, Paul Steiner is the uh, chair of the labor branch. He's a rank and file electrician, IBW 520. Uh, and he's here to speak about the labor branch. Uh, brothers, sisters, comrades. Uh, as Jake said, my name is Paul Steiner. I'm a rank and file member of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. And Local 520, blaze it as uh, some of our apprentices have started calling it. But anyways, uh, as Jake's, uh, so uh, I'm going to talk about how y'all can get involved with the labor branch, right? Uh, the 6%, 6 percent, 6 percent of workers who are unionized in the private sector in this country are shooting down tentative agreements that their bosses have given them like it's the first day of duck season. The capitalist class is hoping that they can simply starve out the workers. And while they cut their health care, while, uh, while they don't pay them their back wages, 
uh, and get the bought and paid judiciary of this country to deny them the right of freedom of assembly on the picket line, they will not be broken. They are still on the march and so is the entire working class of this country. So to that end, uh, the rank and file caucus of the United Auto Workers who are on strike at Deer, uh, they are ra raising funds for the UAW John Deere workers. Uh, and we will be hosting a movie night uh, that will be showing Harlan County, USA uh, to raise funds for these workers who are on strike, right? Their strike fund keeps dwindling every day. They need every dollar they can get. Uh, so if you would like to be uh, involved with the planning of that, reach out to me. Secondly, uh, we need to know about more of the lay of the land in Austin labor. Uh, I know my union is undergoing a contract fight this year. Our contract expires in 2022 in June. There are going to be more people whose contracts expire, and there are going to be more unions that need our help to win that contract fight. So that's, you know, your stagehands, union bus drivers, everybody. And we need to be on top of that in order to be able to be proactive, be able to help and help these workers win. Uh, I know my union is going to be calling on us. I would die before we do not turn out for any of our union's rallies to put some pressure on our bosses. So this is all towards the end of making DSA a fighting working class organization. Worker militancy comes and goes, right? But uh, I know as well as y'all do that the last year and a half was terrible for the labor movement, right? The trade union leaders and at the AFL-CIO offices all but laid down, allow, uh, making the bet that after things quote unquote return to normal, we would be able to push our, push our cause and uh, get better wages out of that. Uh, things have not returned to normal, but what the labor leaders didn't think would happen is that the membership is fighting for the things that they deserve regardless. And that's what's going to need to happen everywhere in order to win contracts that we deserve, right? The workers, the, the workers themselves are doing what people behind big mahogany desks should have done decades ago. So I won't sell you a bill of goods and tell you that, you know, this portends some kind of revolution or anything, but we would be absolutely bankrupt as socialists if we were not capitalizing on a tremendous opportunity to get the working class in motion, to get them to fight and to get them to win. We can't afford to waste chances to allow our coworkers to realize that each and every one of us uh, come to the conclusions that all of us here have come to, right? That we who labor make society run, so we who labor should run society. And that's what needs to happen. So the class struggle isn't going away. So long as one person, so long as one person is making money off of another person's labor, socialists will be there to make sure that we get more of that, more of the value that we create. And so until the working class conquers political power in this country, we can't lie down. We can't, we can't give up and we keep, have to keep fighting. So, uh, you know, so join a union, right? Uh, are you sick and tired of your shitty restaurant job? Join a union. Are you tired of waiting around for workers to realize how powerful they are united? Join a union. Are you tired of having to come in on your day off? Join a union. The organized working class has been the bedrock of every socialist movement in all of history. It's about time we start working on that uh, and making that a reality for DSA. We don't win without the workers. The workers don't win without socialism. So if you would like to be interested in, you know, in getting involved in the labor branch or even getting a rank and file union job like so many of us have done and being on the front lines of the class struggle, talk to me. I will be collecting numbers and helping people get uh, what they need to get involved. Thank you all. Thank you, Comrade Paul.
as someone who is very sick of their uh, shitty restaurant job, that really resonated with me. Uh, <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, if, if the people who are next up on the agenda just, agenda just want to line up here or wherever, that would be good. Uh, next up, we've got uh, our comrade, co-chair, Ana Perez, who's going to be speaking uh, with us a little bit about the Emergency Worker Organizing Committee, uh, better known as EWOC. Sorry, short. Thank you, Ben. Um, hey, everyone. I'm Anna. I'm one of your co-chairs. I'm so excited about tonight. Uh, this is my first in-person general meeting, actually. So if, if you're here and it's also your first meeting, then we're like twins. Um, so yeah, Emergency Workplace Organizing Committee is this one of the coolest projects that we have going on nationally. Um, it's a project between DSA and the United Electrical um, Radio and Machine Workers of America. Uh, so that's really cool. They have uh, an amazing training system where uh, if you're a worker and you're having problems at work, uh, your hours suck, your boss is an asshole, you can get in contact with a local organizer and they'll help you at your job, uh, talk to your coworkers or come up with a plan to, to do something and make changes. Um, if you're a person that's interested in volunteering, they have an amazing six week training uh, session. I did it, it's two hours once a week. Uh, it's a pretty big time commitment, but I will say that it really made a huge difference for me. You're not just going in there and listening to somebody in a PowerPoint. There's like a whole hour of role playing and um, playing out these scenarios and, and seeing how you would actually respond to it. So it's really great. It's going on right now. I did the one in the summer. There's going to be another one. Um, definitely look out for that. Uh, but we are also looking to build our capacity at our chapter because um, our our local is, you know, we, we could do more labor work. Uh, I know that people are familiar with some of the local strikes that happened. And, and if we want to make DSA relevant and have people come to us and ask us what to do, um, and, and you know, give them good solid advice to help them win demands in their workplace, we have to invest in this work in our chapter. Um, so I'm up here to tell you if you, you know, are interested in labor work, I mean, you're a socialist, so let's be real, you're interested in labor work. Um, <laughs> you should do the training, um, come to our meeting. We already have leads uh, with workers who are looking for help in the community. So it's on us to gain the organizing skills. Um, and these skills, you know, they transfer to campaigns like Prop A, to doing uh, tenant organizing. Um, you know, it's socialism 101, learning how to talk to people and get them to realize their power and realize that they can win these demands. Um, so come to our meeting on November 8th. Uh, it'll probably be on Zoom. Uh, but we'll be talking about how we can really build out our capacity as a chapter to support the local labor organizing. And it doesn't matter if you're not in a union, um, you can still become an organizer. So November 8th, 7 p.m. That's too, that's too tall. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Anna. Uh, yeah, that, you know, the beginning of her speech, uh, raised an interesting question. How, how many people here are here at their first in-person, uh, DSA meeting? Hey, pretty good. Pretty good. <laughs> nice. Uh, there's a lot of people here too. Uh, good to see everybody. Uh, next up, uh, continuing the theme of labor organizing, we have, uh, Crystal Marr who uh, is a longtime service industry worker and a very good organizer. And uh, she's going to be talking to us about uh, local service industry organizing and stuff. Hello, thank you. Uh, yes, I am a local service industry member. I've been part of the industry for 13 long, painful years. Um, this injury is not from the service industry. 
but I do want to just quickly address my injury. Um, I want to say thank you to all of you for supporting me while I hurt myself this past week. You shared a GoFundMe, you donated, you reached out to me. Like y'all, everything that y'all did for me in the past week just meant everything. And it's why I'm part of this DSA. It's like, I just want to say thank you guys so much for that. <laughs> y'all made my week. So let me talk about my horrible industry. As Paul said, you can quit your shitty service job and you can go join a union, but I say, fuck that, form a union, right? We don't have enough unions in this town. We, the Austin service industry is one of the largest economies in Austin and we have no rights. I make 213 an hour. I don't have health care, even though they promised me I would have it. I don't have it. They promised me all these things and I never get them. And what we need to really show workers in this town is they hold the power. This is a time where service industry members have had more power than they ever have before, but they don't know how to tap into it. So what we need to show them is about Ewok going to those trainings. I did that course and it empowered me so much to know how to talk to my coworkers about how to stand up for themselves, how to tell the boss to fuck off, I need more money, all that good stuff. Like we don't know that we can do that because no one's ever taught us. Most service industry members, they still think unions are illegal. We know that's not true, right? So what can you do to help us? You all work in restaurants or you eat in restaurants, you dine in restaurants, you know restaurant workers. I know some of y'all work in the service industry that are here today. So there are things that you can really be doing. It's talking to your coworkers and helping them dream about the power that they hold, helping them tap into that power, teach them about collective action and what their voice can really do for them. We had like this weekend at my job, we had a coworker make a big old fuss about the air conditioning. He stood up to our bosses and he had everyone stand behind him. And now guess what? The AC is starting to get fixed. Now, what did they do to that worker though? He scared them. He scared them with his power. So they've written him up already. They've tried to mess with his shifts already. They've already tried to scare him to never do that again. Why he will do that again is because I got to him first. <laughs> I got to him first and I said, you know what? What you did was powerful and you can do that again. And you can do that with everyone. And I helped him dream about a better future in our restaurant. And now he's with me. He wants to fight with me to form a union in the service industry. I have another coworker here with me today who believes the same thing as me. He wants to help me fight to form a union in my job. It's really hard though, because people are scared. We make 213 an hour, you know, we don't, we're very scared. We live paycheck to paycheck. Also, we get fed up and we think, you know what? I'm just gonna go get another job. It's just easier. Our bosses tell us to do that. You don't like it, go get another job. But no, I don't wanna go have to bounce from job to job to job where you continue to abuse me, take advantage of me and expect me to just, they always say like, well, these are jobs for teenagers. So you should be getting teenager money, X, Y, and Z. That, exactly. How do I know a teenager isn't supporting their family right now, right? 13, 14, 15 year olds, they're contributing to their households a lot of the time. They're taking these jobs to contribute to their households because their parents aren't making enough money, right? They deserve real money like we deserve real money. What I need everyone to do is if you know a service industry worker, give them my phone number and I will help them get to the right place. They could be joining jobs that are currently in underground campaigns. I don't know if anyone's familiar with the term salting, but we have salting campaigns going on right now, right? What it would mean for Austin to have a service industry, industry union would be just like the biggest deal. It would change the game. It would inspire so many workers to stand up for themselves. And that's what we're working on doing right now with the restaurant organizing project. Yeah. Right. Yes. <laughs> The Restaurant Organizing Project is a national project. So we are connected everywhere. We have solidarity everywhere. We currently have friends working on the HelloFresh campaign. We have friends that are working in Seattle on underground campaigns. We have underground campaigns in Austin. If you work in the service industry, if you hate your job, if you're tired of being exploited, come get exploited with me instead. <laughs> but at least you're working for something, right? If you wanna do it in your own workplace, join the Ewok 
classes. They will really help you. But if that's not enough for you, we have skills-based trainings every Monday at 1 p.m. on Zoom. It's a national call and it teaches you how to map your workplace, how to have a conversation with your coworkers to get them to dream about a better future, how to agitate them in the right ways to get them to kind of perform collective action. It's really important to educate the workers right now on how to uh, develop these skills because we just don't have these skills right now. I started doing this like a year ago and already I'm in an underground campaign. I'm recruiting workers. I'm talking to y'all today about why we need this. We need to form more unions in Austin. My friend Marshall over here, he wants this to be the union capital of the world. And I want to make that dream come true. I know y'all want to make that dream come true. So if you know service workers, get them to me, get them to Chris, Don, Aaron, Marshall. We're all working really hard with Restaurant Organizing Project to make sure that we have the rights that we deserve, the pay, the respect, the everything that we deserve. No more bouncing around jobs. If you hear of places like Juiceland that are going on strike, support them. We need strike funds. We need to support them. We need to educate them. We need to scare the shit out of these bosses so that they know not to mess with us anymore. We hold the power here and that's why they're freaking out right now. It's good that they're upset. I wanna make them more upset. That's right. <laughs> I wanna make them so upset. I wanna make them as upset as I've been for 13 goddamn years. <laughs> so I will just end this with saying, Please, 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 if you are interested in salting, come talk to me. It is a really empowering thing to do to help people realize the potential they have as workers. Um, and we really need to empower the restaurant industry right now. It's such a huge economy in this town and they deserve it. Solidarity, y'all. Uh, thank you so much, Crystal. Good, good speech. Yeah, there, I mean, there's no reason. There's no, there's no uh, natural barrier uh, to Austin being a union town. That you know, that's something we can do if we really put our minds to it. And uh, you know, that's kind of what we're all about. And uh, you know, I think a lot, of, a lot of the uh, labor, labor action uh, that's going on right now and is going on generally uh, is in places that already have higher. Uh, union density, uh, you know, places like the Midwest and uh, the Northeast, you know, and uh, I think we need to see more of that in, in the South and uh, in the Southwest, uh, where there are millions and millions of people who work paycheck to paycheck, like a lot of us here do. Uh, you know, Austin is not all uh, 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 high, you know, salaried uh, tech employees. It's not, you know, that, that's a small portion of people. Uh, this, this town is built on the backs of, of construction workers, of restaurant workers, of all of these different people who, you know, make minimum wage. Uh, and, uh, you know, that being, uh, with that in mind, there are unions in Texas, uh, as we've heard about. Uh, and uh, in fact, there are strikes in Texas. And uh, here to talk about one strike that's going on, uh, we have Serena. Uh, who uh, walked uh, uh, walked the picket line with the uh, San Antonio Symphony uh, musicians who are out on strike right now. So. Hi y'all, how y'all doing? <laughs> Woo, okay, cool, cool. Oh my gosh. Oh, I can't believe it's been this long since our last in-person meeting. It's, this is, oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm so glad all of y'all made your way down here, even though it's dark and probably mosquito infested. Thank y'all so much for coming. Um, go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Serena. Um, I am currently a student at UT and ACC, um, co-chair for UT YDSA. Shout out to my YDSA folks in the back. Hell yeah. Um, and I am in school to become a nurse, um, specifically a rank and file nurse, um, union just like my mom. <laughs> So um, last week, I had the opportunity to drive 
about two hours from my workplace straight down to San Antonio um, and to go and pick it with AFM Local 23, um, which is the union for um, the musicians of the San Antonio Symphony. Um, so just some background information real quick. Um, late September, um, management and the union sat down to negotiate a contract um, and just some background information before that. Musicians accepted an 80% pay decrease, pay cut over the pandemic in order to keep the symphony running. Um, and a lot of these incomes were supplemented by private lessons and um, other sort of quote unquote side hustles um, in order to um, you know, be able to still maintain um, rent, pay bills, get food, all the while working with this huge pay cut in the middle of a pandemic um, as a musician in the city of San Antonio. Um, so late last September, they sat down with management. It was like, management was like, hey, um, we've proposed our last best final contract, which um, essentially proposed an austere program for the musicians of San Antonio, which included um, cutting the musicians pay um, down to about $30,000 a year, um, which is obviously not a living wage. Have the ensemble, are you gonna have a band with half of the ensemble and dismiss full-time musicians to part-time. So this is a big deal for me personally. As a former band kid, I used to play with a clarinet. I didn't go on to college with a music degree, obviously, but I was able to stand um, at the picket next to a violinist named Phil, who had three kids go to Baylor, a &M, UT, all had some sort of um, music experience, but ended up going into jobs like accounting, um, nursing, which isn't boring, but all of these regular jobs that don't really sort of fit um, along the lines of the path that Phil took. Um, and Phil, just chatting with him next to the picket line, um, it was great talking with him and sympathizing as a younger um, worker and as a former band kid, I'm talking to someone who has spent a lot of time working really hard for this job. Every single musician in that symphony worked their asses off for that job. There are world-class nationally recognized musicians in that symphony who are having to deal with management who don't really care about the work that they do, not just for the symphony, but for the entire city of San Antonio. They don't just work their asses off to provide great concerts for everyone, but they also provide private lessons for students. They provide lessons for other students in public um, in different districts of San Antonio um, to teach them not just music, but um, the camaraderie that comes with being in a community like a band. And this all comes down to the strike that AFM Local 23 has been ongoing, which has been ongoing for, well, they've been on strike since September 27th. Tomorrow marks a month since they've been on strike. Um, and management still has refused to sit down with the union to negotiate with the union, to even acknowledge the union's demands that they deserve a living wage, that musicians and San Antonio and not just a symphony deserve good union jobs as musicians. Um, so that's kind of my whole spiel <laughs> for what's going on. Um, and since San Antonio is kind of, I guess, right around our backyardish, um, I'll give y'all an action item real quick. Um, they're actually having another rally this upcoming Friday, October 29th. Um, at the Veterans Memorial Park from 6.30 to 8 p.m. That is Friday, October 29th from 6.30 to 8 p.m. at Veterans Memorial Park, um, which is across the street from the Tobin Center, which is where they usually perform. Um, and so with that, I'll actually not just close out with that, but I want to lead us out 
in a little chant that I had a lot of fun chanting at the picket line. Um, so it goes a little something like this. Ludes the management, not the band. Okay, I'll say ludes the management and y'all say not the band. All right, cool. It'll feel like we're in the picket together in case y'all aren't able to go. But hopefully some folks from San Antonio DSA who are out there with like sodas and drinks. Um, shout out to San Antonio DSA, um, solidarity. <laughs> um, so yeah, let's go ahead and start chanting. Lose the management, not the band. Lose the management. Lose the management. Lose the management. Thank you, Serena. Yeah, I mean, how, how many, uh, you know, how many people in the working class have a similar story where the pandemic rolled along, uh, they were the ones who felt the pain from it. You know, employers uh, got all sorts of uh, crazy loans from the federal government, uh, you know, tons of restaurants in Austin that are now complaining about how they can't pay their workers. Uh, Where's my money? That's right. <laughs> it, it, you know, I, I mean, it's just it's just ridiculous. And so it's good to see uh, some some of these people fighting back. Uh, next up, we've got uh, all star uh, speaker, another rank and file electrician. We've got Dave Pinkham. Let's go. <laughs> Uh, hi, I'm Dave Pinkham. Uh, like my union brother Paul, who spoke a little bit ago, I'm a rank and file member of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 520 here in Austin. Uh, we build shit. Uh, it's cool. Uh, I have no idea what I'm going to say because everybody already said all the stuff I was going to say. So I'm just going to follow my heart a little bit. Um, so I was just talking about the picket line. How many of you have ever been on a picket line? Raise your hand. It's okay if you haven't, like, it's not a shame thing. It's just like, right? So it's not that many, right? And that is a product, and that is the conditions of the, of the circumstances in which we live, where working class people like us, I, I assume, how many, how many of you work for a wage for a living? Well, that's a lot more. Okay. Imagine that. Where working class people like us have been intentionally robbed of all the power that we have together by laws, by bosses, by union busting, all the bullshit, right? Oh, yeah, it's all freedom, right to work, blah, blah, blah. No, it's not. It's bullshit. All right, well, that's the end of that train of thought. <laughs> if you ever have the opportunity to go stand in solidarity with anyone who's on strike, uh, it's both badass for them when they find some random person showing up to their picket line and saying, I'm with you, especially if you say I'm with you because I'm a socialist. And socialists believe that the working class should control the world, right? But it's also really transformational when you see people who are not politicized, who don't, who are not ideologues like uh, certainly I am. I, I, I can't speak for all of you, right? who nonetheless, because of the situation that they're put in, are standing up and fighting for themselves and for their loved ones, uh, for the dignity that they deserve. Okay, so I'll stop about that. My local union, which has contract negotiations coming up next in the spring. Uh, our contract expires, uh, I think at the end of May or beginning of June next year, huh? June 1st, thank you, Paul. June 1st, right? Electric, union electrical workers in, in the city of Austin and the surrounding areas who are members of Local 520 before three years ago had not had a raise in more than a decade and not just had not had a raise, had not even had cost of living adjustments. Their, our pay went down, right? People lost money. Housing costs go up. All the shit goes up. Taxes on us go up, but it doesn't go up on rich people. And so, you know, this is the situation we're in. Uh, we had a pretty good deal last time, comparatively, and we got a pretty good raise. Money's not the only thing, but it's, it's a big one. If you don't have enough wages to pay your bills, then it's difficult to talk about anything else. Uh, 
as much as there are many other things to talk about, like health insurance, et cetera. So what I'm really up here is just to tell you, uh, one of the largest local unions is coming to a critical juncture where we're gonna be fighting for the dignity of our members. And our members are, like I was saying earlier, largely not politicized and very broad, right? Some of them are Republicans, conservatives, liberals. They think I'm a liberal, I'm not a liberal. Yeah, that's right. Uh, but this juncture, this, you know, this conflict between us and the employers, our employers, has the potential to both materially improve our circumstances in a, in a real big way. Let me tell you, I need a fucking raise. And I need some other stuff too. Like a couple of like paid sick days would be great. You know, like right now I don't have shit. So uh, it, that conflict, that strife that clearly delineates the sides, the us and the them, because that's what it is. It's us versus them. It's capital versus labor. It's the workers versus the bosses. It's the people versus the corporations or whatever, you know, or the 99% versus 1%, et cetera, right? And this is a place where, I'm sorry, I'm not staying in front of the stream, I'm my bad. <laughs> this is a time when like a significant portion of organized working class people in, in our area are gonna be pitted into that conflict. And we're gonna go to our bosses and we're gonna tell them, we need like a lot more right now. And they're gonna say, no, we can't afford to, you know, we're not really making that much money. We're poor, we're broke. My boss owns a fucking Formula One race truck. Right? So that's the situation we're going to be in. And all this hype that, I, and, you know, I'm just really kind of talking because I didn't, I, everyone saw my shit say, but when the union stands in conflict with the bosses, it is the task of organized socialists to stand in solidarity with the union in that conflict. There's going to be a time, like Paul said earlier, when our local is going to need the help of this organization, this socialist party, or as close to that as we have in the United States right now. You guys are the closest thing to a socialist party in the United States in 100 years. Right here. This is it. And we're going to need your help. And so... Be ready because we're going to call on you and I hope that you'll be there for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. I, uh, okay. Let's see, how do you do this? There we go. Uh, <laughs> next up, we've got, uh, we've got Ben Sotheby, uh, who is going to be talking about uh, why, why you should get a union job, which is a recurring theme. Ben Sotheby, I should mention, uh, newest member of the LC. Welcome. Hello, everybody. Hola, buenas noches. Hello. I'm so glad to be here with you. And with everybody who's streaming online, they say hello too, by the way, in the chat. My name is Ben. I use he, him, el pronouns. I'm so glad to see you guys. I'm so glad to see everybody here. Y'all are my favorite people because you care, because you care about the people who live around you. And Dave really hit some of the points that I was gonna say, and that's okay. The why join a union, right? Like why, why do that? He had a lot of good reasons, right? It's, it's you know, together we, we organize, together we bargain, by ourselves, we beg the boss, right? Uh, and, and another way of thinking about it as socialists, right? S S Austin Democratic Socialists. Well, like I was thinking about that yesterday and, and it means we care about democracy, right? It care, we care about democracy, but not just in the political realm, also in the economic realm. That means that we put people first, right? People before profits. And that's, that's not how your boss sees it. That may be a surprise to some of y'all. Now, you guys know that. You've been known that. 
uh, sometimes sometimes we we forget about it but when somebody tells us yeah the, the boss makes a dollar you make a dime or now a penny right boss makes a dollar you make a dime that also reminds us why joining a union is important because the the nature of that relationship is not equal you're working they're profiting and who controls that relationship? Who has power there, right? Who has say? Well, the union is you and the people you work with getting together and saying together, we have say. We have an option to tell people who are our employers, hey, we, we, we need to weigh in on this because it affects our lives. They're not missing meals, right? You know, well, neither am I, but uh, they're, not, they're not missing meals. They're making, they're making their payments real easy because they have a lot of people working. And every time somebody works, they take a little bit of that value multiplied times however many. So that's one of the big reasons why you should join a union because it's a, it's a chance to organize and exercise democracy in the place where you work. All right, so let's get down to brass tacks. How? Real practical. How do you join a union? Well, there's a few ways. The easy way, the way I did it, I got a job at a place that already had a union and then, and then I joined. If I could go back in time, I would have joined even sooner. It took me, it took me a little bit to, to find the paperwork and fill it out. Now they made it an online form, it's great. So let's talk about it. Uh, a great way of getting into a union job here in Austin is with our public sector unions. We've got AFSME, the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, Local 1624. I'm proud to be a member, AFSME 1624. We got a few members out here tonight. Our, our meeting's on Thursday. I need y'all to show up. Uh, so so who, who that is, AFSME 1624 organizes those who work at the city and the county, Travis County. So the workers there get together, and then they tell their bosses, elected officials, by the way, hey, we need this raise. We need days off. We need the lowest paid amongst, uh, amongst us. We need them to be given big bumps. That's the power of a union. I would be remiss without shouting out. I would be remiss. I love fireworks. It's you know something I enjoy. So uh, how festive. Uh, you know, one of the great things about organizing here in, in Austin is we also have our public sector brothers and sisters and comrades who work at the state. TSCU, Texas State Employee Union, is a great way to organize if you work for the state. Or if you work for UT, did you know that they also organize under the, the Texas State Employees Union? So that covers some of our, you know, and then uh, at the federal level, we've got letter carriers. We've got, we've got people who work in uh, many different unions here in town and, uh, and they're also organized. Now, some of the other ways that you may know, and you may have heard from some tonight, uh, you heard from people who are in the uh, local IBEW 520, uh, the electricians union. They are uh, organizing people who work in construction trades, but it's not just the electricians. There's plumber pipe fitters, carpenters. If you wanna be a tin snip, there's sheet metal workers. Uh, there's all kinds of unions in the trades. That is a great way to learn a trade, a skill. And it's a great way to get, uh, to get some training and also to also work. And, and uh, another, another way of joining a union uh, we heard from tonight is starting a union where you work. <laughs> Restaurant organizing project. You can get trained on how to build a union. And I believe me, there are people here in this town at this meeting who will help you organize your coworkers. We will teach you the tried and true strategies. It's not just something that you do on a whim. You have to plan it out. You have to learn from those who fought before us. And that's another thing that I wanna mention about unions. It gives us a tie 
to the long history of labor organizing, not just here in this country, but beyond all the borders that people have invented. Workers have been organizing since bosses have been exploiting. And the more we, the more we learn about their struggles, the better our struggles are. We don't have to start from scratch. They've left us notes. And those, those struggles that came before, being part of a union lets you, lets you be part of that proud history. I'm gonna bring it back to my, my union that I started with. I'm a member of Ask Me 1624. The last march that Dr. King participated in was an Ask Me march. I am a man march. It was rank and file organized members of an Ask Me union who are sanitation workers. They worked for a city, keeping people healthy by organizing people who picked up trash. And they weren't being treated fair on their job. It was unsafe, they weren't respected, and they weren't paid. So rank and file members of an AFSME chapter came together and they met some resistance at all kinds of levels of power, but they made it happen. People paid attention and now it, everyone claims it. Everyone call, claims it on Martin Luther King Day. But remember it was rank and file organizers, rank and file members of a local that started that. Oh, yeah. So as socialists, we have a responsibility to organize in our communities and the place where we spend most of our waking hours, good old work. You can talk to people about very basic things like, hey, what's something that you wish you can get from the boss that you can't get? And if you go together, you, you have a stronger fighting chance. That's why you should join a union. If you have any more questions on how to do it, what training you can get to, to join a union or a place that already has a union or to form a union where you currently work, reach out. We're here to help. I'm so glad that y'all are here tonight.